G'day, welcome back to this video. Um, well, analysis of Robert Breaker's video, so you think you can lose it. Um, if you haven't watched the first video, I recommend you go and watch that one first because um, in this part of the video here, we identify a whole bunch of different errors um, and I also kind of lay some groundwork showing you different PDFs from my website and showing you my website here. We just go through some of the basic things that we'll probably be, well, we'll be building on in this video. So if you'll take Jesus and what he did on the cross, plus this over here, no, no, salvation is not plus anything or minus anything. It's all trusting in the Savior for salvation. So what is salvation? Well, Paul calls it eternal life. So yeah, in the first video, I kind of pointed out that there's, there's no significant difference in having to believe and having to believe and repent. But he says, if you just have to believe, then it's not of yourself, it's from God, it's by grace, etc., etc. But if you have to believe and repent, well, it is of yourself, and it's not of God, and it's not of grace, and all these other things. Um, yeah, it's just foolishness. I mean, the same argument he's putting against our position can be put against his own. He says, oh, well, if you have to believe and repent, it's of yourself. Well, if you have to believe, it's of yourself. They say, I've actually had faith alone Christians concede and say, okay, okay, so it is a gift, even if you have to repent. But it's not a free gift. Well, it's not a free gift if you have to believe either, is it? You know? And he uses that later on in this video. He says, it's a free gift. Romans 5 says it's a free gift. Yeah, well, if it's a free gift, why do you have to believe? And if believing to have your free gift allows it to still be free. Why doesn't believing in departure from evil allow it to be a free gift as well? I mean, how come there's some kind of line drawn between believing and believing and repenting? You guys are just making it up as you go. It's wishful thinking. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 7. In Hebrews 5, 9, he calls it eternal salvation. And in Hebrews 9, 12, he calls it eternal redemption. Yeah, Hebrews 5, 9 says eternal salvation to all who obey him. So that verse is a proof passage against his doctrine of justification by faith alone. Eternal salvation to all who obey him. So obviously that verse is, is something he holds as being relevant to the Bible, uh, relevant to his doctrine, because he just used it as proof for what he's saying. He said, look, Hebrews 5, 9 says eternal. Yeah, well, it says it's to all who obey him. And you say you don't have to obey him because that'd be works. So salvation is something that is eternal. Okay? It, it affects eternity. What is eternity? Well, um, I've got a lot to write up here, so I don't know where to put everything. But to me, God is outside of eternity. So here's God, and he's outside, and here's time. And we're inside time, but God is outside of time. He is in eternity. But we're here on the timeline, I don't know, somewhere around here. So God's outside looking down. And God says, now when you get saved, I'm going to give you a free gift. Romans chapter 5 talks about salvation being a free gift. And it's a free gift of eternal, what? Life. So if it's an eternal life, that's the gift of salvation, is eternal life, then it is life for all, what? Life for all eternity. It's a free gift of eternal life. So what is salvation? It's eternal life. <laughs> How can you lose eternal life? If you can look... Yeah, so it's a... It's another case of them using only part of the scripture, like in this PDF that's on my website. It's the fourth one down there. Um, Faith alone, doctrine fits only part of the scripture. So just like they say there's none righteous and build doctrine on that, as if the Bible doesn't also say there are both righteous and wicked people, now they come forward saying that, oh, we already have eternal life. The Bible also says that we have not yet obtained it, so we can go to Paul in Philippians 3. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, 
Verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. You see that? We could also go to, say, Hebrews chapter... I think it's Hebrews chapter 10. Um, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise... But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So we are of those who do indeed endure to the end. You can also look at chapter 3 for a similar message. Um, But Christ as son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing, of the hope firm to the end. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The Bible talks about people who had fallen away. We can look at the end of First Timothy and other places. Look in the last verse. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Strayed concerning the faith? In that same letter, in chapter 4 at the start, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. Is Robert Breaker saying that those who do not believe shall be saved? Or some who do not believe shall be saved? The Bible says those who do not believe shall be condemned. His doctrine says if you go from being a believer that is therefore saved to being a non-believer, well, you're still saved. The Bible says he who does not believe shall be condemned. We can see it. It's all through there. It's at the end of Mark. He who believes and is baptised will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. According to Robert Breaker, he who does not believe might be saved. No, it's a case of, although you are in line to inherit it because the Holy Spirit indicates you've currently, well, you've entered into God's forgiveness and you are currently forgiven, you are forgiven pending your obedience into the future like if i go and give someone an inheritance well i write them into my will i've given them something haven't i have they obtained something well in one sense yes but in another sense they are yet to inherit it and that's all that's happening so i mean you can see their argument but Um, yeah, it's not going to hold up to some Bible study. As soon as you start studying the Bible, seeing that Paul said that he hadn't obtained yet and that inheriting the kingdom of God is spoken of as something that's in the future and there's talk of people who had fallen away from the faith and the Bible says that those who don't believe are condemned. Um, You can't agree with what he's saying. So he he either hasn't read it or he's just... Maybe he's got excuses for these things. I don't know. You'd have to wait for for some kind of response. But, you know, um, he should be putting forward responses to to these objections as he goes. You know, like if I want to teach a doctrine, I won't just teach verses that support my conclusions. I'll also mention what other people would say to try and disprove me and counter their arguments against it. He doesn't do that something that's eternal that it wasn't even eternal to begin with because eternal means it always was and always will be that's eternal has always been so he says people like me are damned what happens if he changes theology to what i have he 
he who he says I'm a non-believer, even though I depart from evil in the fear of God. How, how can you fear someone that you don't believe in? But anyway, so yeah, why doesn't he talk about that scenario where someone such as himself becomes a non-believer? Do they still believe? And and if they uh, sorry, are they still saved? And if they are still saved, why are you teaching a doctrine that says people that believe what I believe are damned? Why don't you be more specific and say, well, they're damned as long as they haven't previously believed in our doctrine of lawlessness. His doctrine is foolishness. All those who are deceived by it either haven't read the Bible or they're just not paying much attention. Shall always be. That's eternal. So if salvation in the Bible is defined as eternal life, then it's something that it lasts for all eternity. How could you lose that? Yeah, well, once you inherit it, you won't lose it. If you could lose it, then it wasn't eternal. It was temporal. Well, if you already had it, it wouldn't be something you were later going to inherit. And it would be something that you already had attained. But instead, Paul writes that the resurrection from the dead is something he had not yet attained. So, if you think you can lose it, what you really lose, the first thing that you really lose, is the signification of the word eternal. Well, if someone comes to me and says, hey, I've decided that Later on, you will inherit eternal life. I'm giving it to you as a gift. Did they just give me a gift of eternal life? Yes. Do I have eternal life? Yes. Is it also true that I don't yet have it and will later receive it? Yes. He hasn't thought of these things. When the Bible says eternal life is what you get when you're saved, I'm sorry. It doesn't really mean that. No, it's not really eternal. That's what you have to believe if you believe you can lose it. You have to go and you have to... Well, you can see his statement is false there because I believe you can lose it and I don't believe that it's not eternal. Say, no, words don't have meanings. No, no, don't listen to that. No, that's not really what it means. No, uh, eternal means eternal. So, man, this is all just him putting on a big silly show. And you can see how some of it's only kind of half half um, truthful. A lot of it's just a big fluffy act. He's a very, um, I can't find the word I'm looking for. He's very animated and, yeah, I find him to be not genuine, disingenuous. <laughs> I don't care what you think it means. It says what it means and it means what it says. And it says when you're saved you get eternal life. And what does the rest of the Bible say? He doesn't care. He's got a little half a verse over here and he builds doctrine on it and now he's just yelling it into the camera. You watch how it goes on. He gets more and more angry. Whoever wrote him these emails really stirred him up. And that means life for the rest of eternity. How could you lose that? If you could lose it, then it was an eternal life. It was only 10. Well, are you going to die? Yes. So do you have eternal life now? No. If you did, it wouldn't be that you were going to die. See? What do you know? Someone who has eternal life can die, according even to you. Temporal life. Okay, so God lied? No. No, I don't believe God's a liar. So somebody is not looking at the definition of words, and I think we need to do that. Now, go with me to John... Ch yeah, the same definition of words fits with both doctrines, but anyway. Chapter 3, verse 15. So if you think you can lose salvation, what are you saying? You're saying the word eternal doesn't mean eternal. Uh, well, you've got a problem. I'm going to go by the definition of what words mean. And I'm going to go by the Bible. The Bible says when I get saved, I get eternal life. I get justified. I get redeemed. I get forgiven. But you think I don't get that. Because if I have that, then it's by definition something that's going to last for all eternity so that it can't be lost. Yeah, so you get forgiven pending your obedience into the future. So eternal life is something you currently have um, and you can change condition into not no longer having it. Um, they never talk about these alternative interpretations to their own. You know, like, 
like whenever they argue, they put forward a dodgy version of their own position, not realizing that they contradict themselves and don't agree with the rest of the Bible. And they never put forward what would be obvious objections to their doctrine. But then they'll also argue against a false version of what we believe. They're, they're all over the place. It's, it's shocking. Does that make sense to you? I hope it does, because it makes sense to me. John Ch yeah, it makes sense. But um, like I can see what he's saying in the, in the process of logic that he's gone down. But um, also I see a whole lot of other scripture that you could not get to fit with that. So it's as if he hasn't read the scripture or he's just pretending it's not there. Chapter 3, verse 15. John 3, 15, the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. There it is. Salvation is eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only God son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, okay, if I have it, then I have life for all eternity. How could I lose that? How could I lose eternity that I didn't get eternal life if I could lose it? It doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. It's a conundrum. It's, a, it's an enigma. It's, a, it's something. It does not go together. If it's eternal, it's forever. Well, like I already explained, if someone gives you an, something that you will inherit later, they come up to you and say, here, you can have that, but you, you'll inherit it later. You don't actually have it yet. Have they given it to you? Yes. Do you have it? Yes. Do you also not have it yet? Yes. Let's look at verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Hath everlasting life. So when I got saved, I have everlasting eternal life. It's a possession, a present possession, and it's not... Well, if he did get saved, he would have entered into having salvation pending obedience into the future. And he would now be wise to all of the strong warnings in the Bible saying you better obey or God will cut you off into delusion and damnation. But of course, he's not aware of any of them. He's, he's the character in the Bible that's the um, damned false convert that refuses to repent, but also on some level thinks he's repentant enough. If you were actually to ask Robert how unrighteous he thinks he is, it really depends on the context of the conversation. If you're talking about faith alone, he would say, oh, yes, I'm very unrighteous. Oh, I, oh I'm so unrighteous. Oh, I'm just so wicked. I could never overcome evil. Oh, I'm a hell-bound, hell-deserving sinner. He wouldn't say he's hell-bound, but he would really play up his repentance. But if you catch him in another context and say, then I think you're a bit of a hypocrite and you're telling like half the truth and you're deceitfully exaggerating that bit and you're kind of mistreating that person. I doubt you could bring him to much repentance at all. And in the past, I mentioned in one of my emails, I think he's deceived into some pride in different elements of his doctrine. His response was, I, I've searched my heart and I find no pride in myself. And I thought, man, you didn't think about that much before you sent it, did you? Because your whole doctrine is based on how you think you're so evil and here I am saying you're proud and you're saying you, you think you're not proud, you think you're not evil. If you think you're not proud, what evil is it you think you're guilty of? Because, man, pride is one of the most easy sins to be fooled into. I mean, pride's the main one I find in myself. But, um, yeah, it's all just a big act, mate. He's a big actor. Not something that I can lose because it is, by definition, eternal, which means it goes on from now on forever. That's what the Bible teaches. Now let's go to John chapter 6 and verse 47. He's always saying that's what the Bible teaches after he's made a statement of what he believes. A present possession. And it's not something that I can lose because it is by definition, eternal, which means it goes on from now on forever. That's what the Bible teaches. Let's go to John chapter 6 and verse 47. John chapter 6 and verse 47. Now, people will say, no, no, Mr. Breaker, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, let's go through it. You know what? I got 14 of these. 
I got 14 points. Let's let's go through 14 different points, okay? And then you. Well, you're off to a terrible start. I can tell you that. Tell me what you think. All right. If you think you can lose salvation, then you lose the Son's promise. By the Son, I mean Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And He made a promise. Jesus Christ, God, manifest in the flesh, said these words in John 6, 47. And Jesus Christ says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. But you say, no, he doesn't. He can lose it. Isn't it more or less the same as the first one? But um, look, again, it's just a case of them using only part of the scripture. When you read, read the rest of the scripture, their conclusion is proven wrong. Okay, yes, it says that the, the Lord promises that you have eternal life. He also promises that you'll lose it if you don't behave. He also promises... Um, that if you abide in sin, you're going to hell. So the Lord said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is better for you, that it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. That's a promise that you will be cast into hell if you don't depart from sin. So yeah, you've got the promise that you have eternal life, but you've also got a promise that you're going to hell if you don't keep yourself departed from evil. And the whole tricky thing that they don't understand is that that departure from God's forgiveness is manifest as being given back to spiritual delusion, unbelief. They don't understand that belief is from God and unbelief is from God. And that whichever you have indicates whether you're currently in his forgiveness or wrath. And another trick to that is there's a second kind of belief which only those who believe can have. And that is a trusting in. You can't trust in someone you don't already believe in. So you don't get any points for believing in God and even believing in the, the proper version of God and Jesus Christ. But you do get points for trusting in in God as you're in covenant with him just like you get points for um, keeping your works straight um, like Abraham by works and not faith only he had God's grace but once you lose the grace you're given to delusion and it's not about building up enough points to to get there it's about keeping yourself right so you don't get put back in delusion Am I supposed to follow you, or do I follow the Savior, Jesus? Man, who's he yelling at? He's he's all angry about something, and like, we're not saying follow us. So what kind of foolishness is that? We're not saying follow us. We're saying follow a correct interpretation of the Bible. It's all about Bible interpretation, and, and he keeps bringing up this idea of, should I follow the Bible or you? Well, we're telling you to reinterpret the Bible. So if you follow us, you're following the Bible. Because he made me a promise. And he said, I give you everlasting life. And you have it. You have everlasting life. I'm looking at this and I'm like, no, I'm going to follow Jesus. But if I, if I do want to follow you and believe that I can lose it, then I've got to say, no, Jesus is a liar, and, and his promise is invalid. No, no, you don't get eternal life, you only get temporal life until you lose it. I don't, see how this doesn't compute? See how this doesn't work? How can... Yeah, so eternal life is something you have pending God taking it away before you actually inherit it. Anyway, I've said that like five times already. Can I follow you in what you say? When the Bible, from the very get-go, is saying, no, it's the opposite of what they say. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Let's go to another one, John 5, 24. There's a spiritual... For any people that watch Robert Breaker, man, what is wrong with you? You sit there and listen to this fool. He's saying that over and over, saying... Um, saying that if you believe in this other person's interpretation of the Bible, 
you're not following the Bible, you're following them. But if you follow my interpretation of the Bible, you're following the Bible. Am I going to follow you or the Bible? Well, that's not the question. The question is, whose version of the Bible are you going to follow? He's such a liar and he doesn't even know that he's lying. That's, that's how, well, that's the delusion that is on him from the wrath of God and it's on him because he's a dishonest person. He doesn't even know that he's bending the truth and carrying on like a fool, contradicting himself and putting forward all these foolish arguments. He doesn't understand it. Thing that takes place. There's a spiritual, I hate to use this word, but I guess I'll, I'll say it. There's a spiritual passage that takes place. John chapter 5 and verse 24. And I just believe what the Bible says. In John 5, 24, Jesus Christ is speaking. And no one, notice what he says. This is Jesus, God manifest in the flesh. I'm going to listen to him, not you. Because he says I can't lose it. And you say I can't. Okay, well in that case, I'm going to just go by what he says because I don't know you. And well, I say that he says that you can lose it. You're not God. Okay, and he is. So I'm going to listen to him and not you. And here's what he says. Well, I'm going to listen to him and not you. In John 5, 24. Do you believe God? You see, this all ultimately boils down to, are you going to argue with God? Because that's what this is. This, you can lose it, is an arguing with God and his words, not with me. See, a lot of people want to make this an argument with Robert Breaker so they can argue. I just say, no, argue with God. Here's what he says, okay? John chapter 5 and verse 24, Jesus says, believe Jesus? You love Jesus, do you? Why don't you listen to him? Here's what he says. He says those who love Jesus obey him. You preach lawlessness in his name. You don't like Jesus. Early, early, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that has sent me hath everlasting life. Doesn't say might have until he loses it, or could have, or maybe it's not really eternal. It's 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 not everlasting. It's temporal life. But it but he has an opportunity to possibly, if he does enough works, keep it. No, he says half. We don't talk about doing enough works. We talk about departing from evil, or you'll get the punishment of that evil. That's all. See, he can't help it. He's just a liar. He can't help lying. He's arguing against a doctrine, and he knows that's not what we believe. No one believes that you get to heaven by doing enough good works. No one. You cannot show me a church denomination that talks about how they won't be saved until they've first done enough good works. That Christianity does not exist, but he makes out like that's the only alternative to what he's teaching. That means has. Hath everlasting life. Now watch what it says. This promise of God. And shall not come unto condemnation. What's condemnation? Hell. But is passed from death unto life. But shall not. So there's a passage that takes place. A spiritual passing. That verse. Look at it again. It says when you're saved you have passed from death to life. In Christ, I have eternal life. And I've already passed. There's a spiritual thing that took place when I got saved. And now I have eternal life. Now, if I could lose it, then it was. So he's talking about a spiritual passage being made alive from the dead. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. We were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But we've been made alive. We were dead, now we've been made alive. What's James say? Well, he says, just like Robert Breaker says, there's a passage from being dead in your sins to alive in Christ. Well, James says there's a passage from being alive in Christ to dead in your sins. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death. Now this is written to people who were already saved. If anyone among you, brethren, wanders from the truth, they're already in the truth, they're wandering away into sin, they need to be turned back from sin, turn him back. Those who turn him back from sin 
from the error will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So will save them from returning to being dead in their sins. So, yeah. There's a passage both ways. So, yeah. I mean, what is the relevance of that argument anyway? Just saying that, yeah, you go from being dead in your sins to alive in Christ. There's a spiritual passage. So what? What does that prove? Have you got any proof that it can't go the same way? Well, back the other way as a spiritual passage? No. That's what you should be bringing up. That's the argument. But he doesn't even get the argument onto the table. He's off in la-la land. It's an eternal. Okay, then the whole Bible's a lie. <laughs> and God lied to us. Or else he told the truth, and I can't lose it. Man, he told the truth when he said you will lose it if you don't behave. But you don't have it, so you don't have to worry about that. Oh, yeah, well, a lot of people don't want to believe that. Because you know what that means? That means that the Savior is Jesus. Oh, people don't want that. No, they want to help save. I want to be the co-Savior. I want everyone to know that I'm doing... Well, if you're co-Savior, doesn't that mean Jesus is Savior? And if you have to believe, doesn't that mean you're co-saviour? So yeah, these arguments are stupid, mate. See so, yeah, his whole video, his whole ministry, well, part of his ministry, is mocking the truth. The truth is his enemy. Like, we come forward, we try to get some sensible discourse going, and he just lies about what we're saying. And also, in, in other times, he can't even understand what we're saying. Just exaggerates his own position, lies about our position. Like I said, there's no one that believes you have to do good works to eventually get saved. And he says we don't have um, a way of knowing whether we're saved or not over where we are. Hasn't he checked he who believes shall be saved to see if it fits with our doctrine? It fits with our doctrine too. So can't we just go, okay, he who believes shall be saved. Hey, I believe. But there's more. He who obeys shall be saved. Hey, I obey. He who fears. His mercy is upon those who fear him. Hey, I fear. He who forgives shall be, shall be forgiven. Hey, I forgive. So we can check to see if we fit the criteria. The difference between his doctrine and our doctrine is he only goes with part of the Bible. We go with the whole thing. Not the Old Testament, but he will lie to you and say, oh, no, nah, they're, they're trying to do Old Testament salvation. No. No, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And when he does, he'll just lie about it anyway. Be good so I can get to heaven based upon me. No. You're either trusting completely in Christ alone for your salvation, or you're not. And he... Well, if you're trusting in someone who said, depart from evil or you're going to hell, are you trusting in that person alone for salvation? Yes, in one sense. And in the same way, if you're trusting in your trusting in Christ, are you trusting in Christ alone? No, because you're trusting in your trusting in him. You're trusting in your obedience to the Bible's commandment to believe. You're trusting in yourself, Robert Breaker. Oh, you're so proud and self-righteous. If you're trusting in him plus something you do, you're lost. Because you're thinking that you can get to heaven based upon what you do. And what that does is that tells Jesus what you did wasn't enough. Um, yeah, what he doesn't understand is... See, I went through this briefly in the first chap, uh, first video. You're going to be entering in through grace, okay? So like a parole board, they don't have to give you anything. You're going to grovel your way into heaven. Yes, you already have it there, but you ought to be fearful because they can take it away. Um, but not from him because he's got a promise. He's got a promise from God saying, Robert, if you just do this, whether it be circumcision or believing, you just go and do it. Now God owes you what he offered. 
Robert doesn't need any favour from God anymore. God owes him. God can just slap God in the uh, Robert can slap God in the face on his way in. Say, get out of my way, scumbag. You're already my debtor. You said you'd give it to me if I believed. I believed. Get out of my face. I'm coming into heaven whether you like it or not. If you put me in hell, you broke your promise. No, no, keep reading. There's a promise that you're going to hell if you don't depart from evil. He can't see it. You're basically telling Jesus to the cross, I can get to heaven based upon what I do. That's the greatest blasphemy the world has ever known. Well, if Jesus comes to you and says, I died for the sins of all who repent, and you go, okay, I'll, I'll repent. Are you doing that insulting gesture that he just did to Jesus? No. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. The Bible says he's doing an insulting gesture. He's trampling the blood of God. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. Who are these people? Those who sin willfully after they've received knowledge of the truth. Now, I recently did a video on that. There's people being deceived into thinking that um, if you've sinned since you've been saved, that you're in trouble. No, no, as long as you've re repented, you're fine. It's talking about your current condition, not your past condition. It's saying that if... If you're currently in willful sin, um, you're putting yourself in the place where there's no sacrifice for sins. So depart from that while you still got faith. You're not cut off until you're delusional. Okay? I think it's safe to say Robert Brake is cut off. This guy is just on another planet. For you to think that you're equal to Jesus and put your... Yeah, that's, and that's not to say that he's cut off forever, by the way. But yeah, man, he's just broken into like a new gear. See, see the fury. The cross. I can get to heaven based upon what I do. That's the greatest blasphemy the world has ever known. For you to think that you're equal to Jesus and put yourself up there on the cross with him and say, no, what I do is more valuable than what you did, Jesus. What a lie. Well, how are we saying that it's more valuable? He just added that in there. I'm sure the devil loves you to believe that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Man, the devil loves you to believe that you can be lawless and expect to remain in God's mercy. But anyway, yeah. I'm a little heated today, as you can tell. I'm a little angry because there's people out there lying to people, saying, oh, but you can lose it. But the Bible says, no, 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 it's not something that's even losable. You can't lose salvation. Not according to Jesus. You want to argue with Jesus? You help yourself. Not me. I'm just going to go by what he says. Let's go look at something else he said. Let's go to John chapter 10. He said, forgive or you won't be forgiven. You teach against that. In verse 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. All right, now look at verse 28, 29, and 30. I give unto them eternal life. Now watch what he says. And they shall never perish. They shall never perish. They shall... Yeah, so the question that arises is, can you go from being his sheep to no longer his sheep? Because yes, his sheep shall never perish. And those who are not his sheep shall perish. So I agree that his sheep shall never perish. So he can't even get the right question on the board. No one's objecting to the idea that his sheep will never perish. We're saying that the sheep can become non-sheep and non-sheep perish. What is that? That means you can't lose it. He didn't say, unless they sin. There's no, there's no foot up there unless, no. If you have eternal life, you shall never perish. You can't lose it. That's what the Bible says. And so it says here. But you can be one who is condemned. You can go from a believer to a non-believer. So you can go from being saved to condemned. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 
Well, he's giving us this illustration of like when you're saved, it's like you're in the hand of God. You're in the hand of Jesus. Well, that's a safe place, isn't it? That's a yeah, interesting thing about that is with John chapter, is that chapter 10? Chapter 8, 29 is it? Yeah, so it says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. See how it says greater than all? What it's saying is, my father is the greatest. No one has more power than he. The devil, it's saying that no one will go out of God's hand by being snatched, or in the King James it's translated plucked. No one will pluck or snatch them out of God's hand because God is greater than all. No one overpowers God. But it's not saying no one will ever depart from God's hand. It's not saying the devil won't bring his hand up and invite you to forsake God for a false version of God, like faith alone, and go off and do your, your nightclub sin and, and cheat on your wife and all the rest of it and never come back. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that because God is greater, no one will depart from God's hand through being snatched out. But it's not saying no one will ever depart from God's hand. And again, these are questions that Robert Breaker has never even pondered. They read these verses and they've been taught their doctrine using those verses, but they've never heard these alternative interpretations. I thought about calling this a safe place. <laughs> you know, all your social justice warriors say, oh, I just want a safe place. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I have a safe place. I'm in the hand of God. Because I'm saying, and no one will ever pluck me out. I shall never perish, the Bible says. But not only that, watch this. Watch this. He says here in verse 29, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I am my Father in one. So Jesus says, when you're saved, I give you eternal life. You'll never perish. You're in my hand, safe. But not only that, my Father's hand is holding my hand. And so you're double secure. You're double safe. Now, who in this world is more powerful than God? I know not one. How am I going to lose salvation? Can I somehow start peeling back his fingers? If God lets you go and depart from his hand through free will. And then get rid of God, so Father's fingers, and then peel back God the Son's fingers, and then jump out and say, Woohoo, I'm not safe anymore, I lost it. So see how he's added there that the hands are now restraining him and keeping him on the hand? There's nothing on there. There's nothing in the text about them being locked on the hand and them having to like release God's grip before they can first get away. But he, he just adds that in there. What a liar. What a total and utter liar. But he doesn't even see that he's a liar. How on earth is that possible? I'm not more powerful than God. Are you? I don't think so. So how on earth can you go around saying you can lose your salvation when God says you're double secure and you will never perish when you're saved because you've been given eternal life? I don't know. Are you stronger than God? Are you smarter than God, are you? A lot of people out there think they are. A lot of people out there think, well, I'm Yeah, so those who are currently saved are currently in a condition where they will never perish if you go to being no longer saved you will enter a condition where you most definitely are in line to die and perish so that's the that's the counter argument that he doesn't even address part of the god and i know the bible says that but really what it means is no 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 no, no. why don't you just go jump off of here into a lake or something I mean, don't tell me what you think the Bible says. I want to know what my God... Man, all he does on these videos is tell us what he thinks the Bible says. So why can't other people do the same? God said to me in the Bible, and I'm holding on to him. What a fool. He's saying, uh, I've got what God said to me in the Bible. Don't you tell me what you think the Bible says. Well, whatever the Bible says, that's what God is saying to you. 
And he's saying, no, no, it's what I see in the Bible. Not what you see in the Bible. His promises and his words. And he said, if I trust him, I've got eternal life and I shall never perish. I'm going to go by what he says, not what you say. You're a liar. Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. You're a liar if you're going against what the Bible says. And are we going against what the Bible says? Well, it's a matter of opinion. And we know what your opinion is. But your opinion also includes pedophile priests being in the mercy of God. And those who fear God and depart from it, from evil as a result of that fear still being condemned. And I'm going to listen to you. Can't lose it. But you say, no, we can lose it. Okay. What happens when I get saved? I become a son. John chapter 1. Look at what John chapter 1 verse 12 says. Yeah, you get adopted according to um, Ephesians chapter 1. I think it's verse 4, probably verse 5 actually. If I could lose it, guess what I lose? My sonship. You what now? John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, how? By faith. We trust in Christ through faith. We get eternal life. Now that we received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when I got saved, I got born again, right there in verse 13, which were born. So I'm born again. I am a son of God. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 says, We are all children of God by faith. I'm a child. Matter of fact, in Romans 8, 14, and 15, I'm adopted. I have the spirit of adoption. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of laws about adoption uh, mean that if someone's adopted, it's stronger than if they were actually born from that people. Because the law is more applicative that you cannot deny a son who's adopted. But So what? Now you're going to point to state law for your Bible interpretation. It's not very biblical. I mean, he'd mock other people for doing that. He's always on about how, oh, we've got to use the Bible to define the Bible. Why are you off in the state legislator, in the legislation from your state, using their law to define passages or concepts in the Bible? Adoption. Yeah. Look at the, um, the prodigal son. He went and had his years. He forsook the kingdom. He wasn't under the kingdom. He wasn't under the father's estate anymore. He wasn't faithful. He wasn't in the favor of the father. He had gone away. He was living in sin. It wasn't until he came back. So see how a son can be out of favor with the father? Just because you're a son, that doesn't prove that you can't fall out of that condition into being sons of disobedience. As we saw at the start of, well, this, this is talking about going back to being dead in your sins. The same with um, Ephesians chapter 2 there. Um, the sons of disobedience. Robert Breaker teaches, yeah, the sons of disobedience. Robert Breaker teaches that you can be a son of disobedience and be a son of God. The Bible says no. The Bible says, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments, like Robert Breaker, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. That's Robert Breaker. Robert says, oh no, I know him. I believe. I believe. Do you obey his commandments? Oh, no one can obey his commandments. See how humble I am because I say I can't obey? Well, the Bible says you're to be considered someone who doesn't know him. How can you become an unsung? How can you get unborn again? Have you ever thought about that? Well, the Bible says when you're... God takes the Holy Spirit away from you. Like David pleaded with God saying, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Doesn't that imply that you can have the Holy Spirit taken away? What about Hebrews chapter 6? Hebrews chapter 6 talks about how it's impossible to renew someone who used to have the Holy Spirit. And Robert agrees that those who have the Holy Spirit are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Well, why is it saying here that there's these people that lost the Holy Spirit? 
It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted of the good word of God, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. It is rejected, being near to cursed, whose end is to be burned. Burned. Those who were once partakers of the Holy Spirit fall away. Oh, but you can't lose it. Just don't read Hebrews 6 if you want to believe what Robert's saying. Say this is new birth. You're born again. Okay. How do you lose that? How do you lose your sonship? Sin, sin will lead to your heart being hardened into departing from the living God. Hebrews 3, I think we already went through that. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, departing from the living God. Lest any, any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You need to hold it steadfast to the end. If you allow yourself to dwell in sin, you'll become hardened and you will depart rather than holding fast your faith in Christ to the end. Of course, Robert doesn't have faith in Christ. He has faith in the finished work of Christ alone. I have faith in Christ and the finished work. I also have faith in what Christ said because that is what it is to believe in someone. You believe what they said? Robert doesn't believe what Christ said. Christ said, obey or you're going to hell. Robert says no. I'm Robert Ray Breaker the third. I come from Robert Ray Breaker Jr., my father, and Robert Ray Breaker Sr., his father. My father died 10, 11 years ago. He's still my father, and I'm still his son. I could do the worst sins in this world, and I don't want to. I don't like sin. So what is this foolishness? Now he's saying that someone can never depart someone can never become their son. Look, is it possible for Robert to forsake his father and and to treat his father, well, to be apart from the family, apart from the estate, apart from the inheritance? Yes, it is possible for a son to abandon the household and to forfeit the inheritance. That's possible. But now he's going to pretend it's not possible. And I could move to the other side of the world and move to China and change my name to Ching Chong Ping or something. And I could say, I am no longer the son of Robert Breaker Jr. But really, who's my father? <laughs> Robert Breaker Jr. The devil's your father if you abide in sin. There you have it. He who sins is of the devil. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So whoever abides in evil is of the devil. Robert would say, oh, no, you can't be righteous. Well, to that, John says, little children, let no one like Robert break and deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. So, yeah, you can move to China and do whatever you want. And if you work righteousness, God is your father. If you're in sin, the devil is your father. I mean, it doesn't depend on what I do, whether I'm his son or not. I am his son. I've been born. What did we just see from the Bible? What did we just see from the Bible? See how he's just making stuff up? It's ridiculous. Look, if you are following this guy... You're probably not converted. Some people who watch him are converted, I guess. But look, wake up. The guy is just fluffing on about garbage. He, he makes all this stuff up, all of these arguments. Are you people not checking his arguments? Almost every single argument he puts forward is, base, is wrong on really, really basic levels. Now, the only question is, am I going to be a good son or a bad son? An obedient son or disobedient son? I can't unbecome a son. I can't go, nope, I'm no longer a son. It, it doesn't compute. It, it doesn't make sense. Once you're born again, you're born again. There's no getting born again again and again and again and again. There's no once saved, 
uh, and then you lose it. But then you can get it back, but then lose it, but then get There's no, I was born again, 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 again. That doesn't make sense. We'll have to um, clarify too with Hebrews 6, how there was that pa passage saying it's impossible to renew them to repentance. It is possible for God to renew them to repentance. Um, it's just impossible for us to renew them to repentance because it's God who plugs a person in and casts a person out. As we see in Romans 11. Um, Do not be haughty, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. And this is written to born-again Christians. He may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you, goodness, if. That shouldn't be in there if Robert Breaker is correct. But Robert Breaker is not correct. That's why it's in there. Towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. So for that reason, do not be haughty. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. So, um, and earlier in that chapter, you see that um, God is the one that's keeping people from believing because they're, uh, well, he gives them a spirit of stupor. And in other passages, we see it's because they're evil. Evil, unrepentant sinners are given a spirit of stupor and that's how they are cut off. And Paul is writing here saying, you who are already saved, don't be haughty but fear, for God may give you the spirit of stupor also. Back here. The rest were blinded, giving them a spirit of stupor that they should not see. So they don't believe because God gave them the spirit of stupor and he will do that to you if you do not continue in his goodness. And that happened to me for two and a half years. You can go and watch a video on my channel called I Was Cut Off. Uh, for two and a half years, I'd lost all memory of having ever been saved. I didn't remember the heaven and hell testimonies. Um, yeah, I'd lost my fear of God. And then after two and a half years, I came, repented one morning, and then bam, back came that memory of that month. Um, and ever since, I've had memory of it. But for two and a half years, I was blinded to the fact, to what I previously knew to be the truth. So I'd gone from being being damned to being saved for a month to being cut off, blinded again for two and a half years, plugged back in. Why did I get plugged back in? Well, because God cut me a break seeing that I was repentant and willing to come back in. Same reason he let me in the first time. Why did I get cut off? because I thought I could go out for sin and come back in the morning. I had a silly false doctrine like Robert Breaker. Although I um, I didn't have their doctrine yet, I just kind of made it up on the night. I thought, oh, well, I'll just repent in the morning. But yeah, I can tell you from experience, it doesn't work. You get cut off into delusion. And he who does not believe is condemned. These people that run around and say, you can lose it, you can lose it. Their minds are not working or something. And they're not reading their Bibles because if they did, they would realize. Well, what do you want me to think? I'm just going off what I read in the Bible and my own experience. How can you say my mind is not working? All of your arguments are foolishness. I've had good counter arguments, multiple counter arguments to most of them. And you're, you're so deluded that you don't even anticipate some of these arguments. Like, you should anticipate the response to a lot of these arguments and counter them while you're giving them, give, giving your own arguments. Guys, our relationship to God is he is our father and we are his son. And he... The Bible says he who sins is of the devil, not he who sins is of God. You say he who sins is of God. The Bible says no. He cannot deny his son. If you're a son of God, he can't deny you. Why would you believe that you can lose your salvation? Because the Bible says so repeatedly, like I said in Romans 11, do not be haughty. God might not spare you either. Let's look at another one. I was going to take you to 1 John 3, 1 and 2. I don't have time. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. You can go there and read those. But now we are the sons of God. When we're saved, we're God's son. We can't become unsunned. <laughs> Once a son, oh, 
Yeah, well, if you forsake your household, yeah, you can, you can forsake God's kingdom for sin. Jesus, amen. The next one is. So that's not in the Bible. I thought he was here to share us, to to tell us the Bible. Now he's just what, sharing these little things that are not in the Bible. Once the son, always the son. He's mocking everyone else for sharing their opinion, as if he's not doing the same. It's surety. Surety. Does the Bible teach that you can know you're saved? Well, yeah, yeah. But these people that say you can lose it, they can say, well, you never know if you're saved or not. You just kind of... Yeah, well, I don't say that. Those people have bad theology. Oh, you go around with your fingers crossed all the time, and you just go, oh, I hope I did good, and I hope I'm going to heaven, because I'm really trying... And they think that salvation is dependent upon what they do. And what is that? That's guilty of saying what Jesus did wasn't enough. They've got to do something. Well, no. Jesus. Well, in the same way, you're saying that it's not enough because you say you've got to believe. Jesus said, hey, come unto me. And you're saved by trusting in him. But in 1 John... And he said, obey. So if you don't obey, well, you don't trust him. Chapter 5, and verse 13, the Bible teaches a no-so salvation. The Bible teaches that you can be saved and know that you're saved. First John 5. So, yeah, this is a bit of a problem. Like, how come he doesn't know that there's people that are against faith alone that also have assurance of salvation in their doctrine? Like, he's not very aware of theology. Uh, and I think he prays... I think what's more the case, he knows that there's some people that are against his doctrine that don't have assurance of theology... And he deceives the listeners into thinking that all people, all Christians who are against faith alone, don't have assurance in their doctrine. I can tell you, and I already have, that, yeah, in the doctrine I believe in, we have assurance that we're currently saved. Like in the Old Testament, he who fears, believes, and departs from evil, they're told that they're the people of God. That's what believing in God is about, you know? You believe God, that's why you depart from evil. And you have your conscience clean, like Paul writes in um, Acts chapter 24, is it? I think it's 24, verse 15 and 16. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Oh, but hey, hey, there's none just. Everyone's unjust, according to Robert Breaker. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offence towards God and men. So that's all we're saying. We're saying that you ought to have a conscience clean before God, and that comes from departure from evil. If you're in evil, don't think that you're of God, okay? Depart from that, and then you can be comfortable saying, okay, yeah, nah, I'm fine with God. Don't sit there in evil saying, oh, yeah, I'm a child of God. The Bible says you're a child of the devil. Unless, of course, you listen to Robert Breaker, in which case you'll be upside down and inside out and running around with no pants on in the, in the city on drugs. 13 says, These things that are written unto you that, you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you're saved. All right? Do you know? Do you know that you're saved and on your way to heaven? Do you know that? Well, if you believe... The irony is that some of the people that follow him can't... They believe in a version of eternal security that says, well, those who fall away from being believers to later being non-believers, well, they were never saved. But I think Robert says such people are still saved. But for those who say that those who fall away were never saved, well, those people can't know if they're currently saved. They can only hope that they endure to the end because for them, believing is not evidence that they're saved. Only believing till the end is evidence that they're saved. And because they don't know that they'll believe to the end, they only know that they're currently believing. They can't know that they're actually currently saved. But yeah, like I said, I think Robert Breaker says that such people are, um, are still saved. So... So a Satan-worshipping person might be saved. A Muslim that forsakes Jesus Christ and says that faith alone is foolishness and all the rest of it, they might be saved because once upon a time they believed in faith alone. 
I think that's the doctrine he holds to. If you can lose your salvation, you can never know. You go, well, I don't know. I just hope so. When I get to heaven, I'll, maybe I'll find out. But, but no, the Bible says you can know. How do you know these things are written? It's the Bible. What's written in the Bible tells us what salvation is, how to receive it, and what happens when we get it. And we get saved. We get the free gift of eternal life. It's eternal. It cannot be lost. We have the promise of God himself, Jesus Christ, saying, you will not perish. You are in my hand. And no one can pluck you out. Wow. Man, I'm just going to go by what the Bible says, not what you say. That's why I never get uh, flustered or, or uh, bothered by these people that contact me and say, you can lose your salvation. I just kind of go, that's, that's like saying, the sky is purple. No, 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 the sky is blue. You know, it, it's just so contrary to the very nature of God and the Bible and truth that it's just like, and whatever. Man. How's Robert going to be when he gets to the judgment and God starts looking at his works and all the sin that he hasn't got out of his life? See, Robert Breaker doesn't see the sin in his life. Robert Breaker thinks he's pretty squeaky clean. He might think he's got some sin. There's a whole bunch of sin that he doesn't see in himself that's going to be brought up. He's going to be all confused. Going, oh, hold on, faith alone, faith alone. No. It's written all through the Bible. Like, he really is good evidence that I could use for atheists. I could show atheists the Bible saying, look at all these warnings. This guy says he believes in the Bible but can't see these warnings. And they would have to come to the conclusion that, wow, this, there's something wrong with this guy's mind. And I would say, yeah, look, the Bible says it's a spirit. I mean, he's pretty good evidence that there's something supernatural going on with him. You know? How is it that he can be that blind to the warnings? You know, the, well, the moon is made of cheese. No, it's not. You know, how do you deal with someone who's... The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Yes, they will. I thought you said you believed in the Bible. It's written right in there. First Corinthians. Unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Robert Breaker says, oh, yes, they will. They will too. He who sins is of God. The Bible says he who sins is of the devil. says something that is so outrageous and wrong that it's not even close to what the Bible says. How do you deal with that? Well, today I'm dealing with them. Today I'm going to say, hey, look at them. Man, today you are them, just like every other day. Bible. Would you, would you please look? The Bible says you can know that you're saved. Do you know you're saved? Let me show you this one. Still people will say, no, uh, breaker, uh, yeah, we, we, we belong to such and such a denomination, and we believe you can lose your salvation, and you're just twisting verses out of context. Oh, really? No. Let me show you this one. How do you twist this out of context? How do you, how do you prove your false doctrine of losing salvation when you read this verse? Are these verses? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, that's how he saves us, by his mercy, by his grace, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, yet quickened us. That means brought to life. We're quickened. We're born again. We have new birth. We're new life. We have eternal life in Christ. We have passed from death unto life, as the Bible says. Together with Christ, by grace, are you saved. Now look at verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Bible tells me there's a seat up in heaven. And I don't understand it, but this is what the Bible says. It says I'm already up there. Here's Robert Breaker. That's me. And I am already seated in heaven. Because as far as God's concerned, and he is a, a God of eternity, so he's outside of eternity. When I got saved, my eternity was fixed. And in God's eyes, I'm already seated up there with him in heaven. How do you lose that? 
by annoying God and having him remove that inheritance from you. Like it says, he'll cut you off. Romans 11, 6, do not be haughty, but fear, because he might give you the spirit of stupor, making you not believe, evidencing your damnation and no longer seated there. So what a stupid argument. Seat in heaven. Oh, you got us. Oh, okay, I'll convert to faith alone. I'll be a pedophile priest too, will I? No. All of his arguments are really, really weak. Now, I can't explain it. Maybe it's in spirit. I've got the Holy Spirit in me that I'm saved, and the Holy Spirit's up there. So maybe there's a chair up there, and the Holy Spirit's sitting there, and the Holy Spirit's in me, and God's looking over, and he's like, oh, well, that's Breaker, who's got the Spirit. Now he's, you know, but the Bible says we're seated with him in heavenly places. When Paul wrote this, it means you're in the office of him who was seated, seated in the heavenly places. Like you're in the kingdom. Raised us up together. Made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's just saying that the kingdom is of God. It's not saying you're literally up there. You're on earth. You're not sitting in heaven. He was down here on earth writing this. How can he say we're seated in heavenly places? Well, he did. I think God told him to write that down. It's not even saying that we are seated in heavenly places. You might be reading the King James. Man, you can't take every phrase in the Bible literally. Raised us up together. Made us sit together in heavenly places. It's just saying that we're in Christ and Christ is in heavenly places. So because we're in Christ and Christ is, in, is seated in heavenly places, in one sense we're seated in heavenly places. In another sense, well, we're sitting down here arguing about doctrine. So that all these people run around saying, you can lose it, you can lose it. God goes, no, you be quiet. You can't lose it because you're already seated up there. Wow, you know? Yeah, wow, that's a really bad argument. I don't know about you, but I'm going to believe the Bible. And if you don't, that's on you. See it to judgment, okay? But the Bible says we're already seated with him in heaven. Let's look at this one. Number eight. Yeah, look, personally, I don't believe... I don't know if I believe in this judgment day where everyone will be resurrected and, and put in the one place and God will go through everyone singly. I think Robert has this fantasy where he's going to be facing all the people who believe the doctrine against his and he's going to kind of mock them as God throws them into hell for not being lawless enough. Like people like me. Like Robert has this fantasy saying, well, I'll see you with the judgment. He put that in one of his um, emails to me years ago. See you at the judgment. Ooh, you're gonna like stare me down as your silly god of lawlessness throws me into hell for not being lawless enough. That's your stupid doctrine. So yeah, I'm not gonna be even. I don't think that that judgment is. I mean, it might occur. It might be literal, and it might be like that. It might be the last generation or it might be every soul that ever was. I think it talks about that at the end of what? Matthew um, 25? But um, yeah, I'm certainly not kind of mocking saying, see you with the judgment to to those who believe in other doctrines. You had enough yet? <laughs> like my old grandpa used to say, I'm giving you enough truth to sink a battleship. Now, will you accept it? There's people out there in different enough... Well, your first argument was garbage. Your second argument was much the same as the first. The third one was probably worse than the first two. Your fourth one, well, it's not even part of the passage except to say that no other entity will be plucking you out. It's not... But you instead misused it, saying that you won't be able to escape even if you try. You're like these people that say you couldn't go to hell even if you try. I've heard Faith Alone teachers teach that. He probably teaches it himself. Sonship, it's a bad argument because there is such a thing as a son that forsakes the household. Surety, that assumed that no one that opposes Faith Alone believes um, that they can be saved, and that's not true. Seed in heaven, probably the worst yet. So let's see what number eight is. 
denominations that don't believe this. They believe you can lose your salvation because they have a faith plus works gospel, and they're lost. They're lost religious people. Well, look, what if your doctrine was faith plus half a day's work? Would that imply that you can lose it? No, not all faith plus works doctrines talk about losing it. So, anyway, he might not have meant it to be that precise, but, yeah, he's just vague with what he says. With a false gospel, and they're negating the blood and the atonement of Christ, and it's sad. And it'd be one thing if they believe that, they're just silent about it. But no, they're dogmatic, they're angry, they're hateful, they're mean. They think it's their ministry to go around and attack preachers like me who just preach the Bible and the once saved, always saved doctrine of see it with him in heavenly places because I have his promise that I'm born again as his son and I can't. So, doesn't he realize that I could say the same thing about him? Like I could say, oh yeah, it's all well and good for you to believe it. But when you start preaching faith alone, that's a real problem. Man, so half the arguments he makes against other people can be used equally against him, and he doesn't realise it. Otherwise, he wouldn't put them forward. Lindsay. So I'm just going to give you what the Bible says, okay? If they want to get heated and angry and upset, give me a little bit of, you know, a little wiggle room, if you will, today to get a little heated up too, to give you the truth. Amen? Okay, now look at this. <laughs> Spiritual circumcision. There's a thing that takes place when we get saved called spiritual circumcision. And that is in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, what is that? Well, let me show you. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and who? In Jesus. And ye are complete in him. Oh, I'm complete in Christ. When I got saved, I'm in Christ. Yeah, that's what Paul says, in Christ. And it says, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. There is something that takes place. Now, I don't have time to get into this because it's a lot to get into. But in um, 1 Thessalonians... Chapter 5. So he just said that, yes, we're spiritually circumcised. And then he's going to say that, oh, well, you can't lose spiritual circumcision. Well, back here in the Old Testament, God said to circumcise yourself to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your hearts. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Jeremiah 4, verse 4. Um because of the evil of your doings. Another passage is Ezekiel 18. We looked at this in the, um, in the first video. Oh, it's right down the end, actually. Repent, turn from all your transgressions, cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. So it doesn't mention circumcising your heart to the Lord, but it says get for yourself a new heart. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. So, yeah, take away the foreskins of your heart. Get for yourselves a new heart. And how does that occur? By departing from evil. So say... Um, say I would go back into evil. Couldn't God come to me and say, hey, you, you, circumcise your heart to, to me. Take away the foreskin of your heart. Get for yourself a new heart and spirit by departing from evil. Repent. Couldn't he say that? Whether your heart is circumcised or not depends on whether you're walking in holiness or not. That's all. Can you go from holiness to living in sin yes can you go from living in sin to living in holiness yes so can you go from being circumcised in heart to uncircumcised yes but now he's going to come up with some flimsy theory and teach it as if it's some solid argument 